Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, a consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to my YouTube channel and the very first of my neurophysiological puzzles. With this series, I'm going to be showing you how we interpret nerve conduction tests using the data available to us. So without further ado, let's present the first case. The clinical scenario here is of a 45-year-old man who is a right-handed builder. He has a 12-month history of diffuse tingling in the right hand and up the arm, and he's been dropping items for the last three months. Symptoms are present all the time, and it's not clear if and when it gets worse. He seems to have it all the time. Clinical examination is relatively unremarkable in terms of the appearance. There's no visible muscle wasting. Tone is normal in the upper limb. Power is 5 out of 5. There's only mild subjective weakness in the hand muscles. Sensation shows reduced pinprick in all fingers and coordination is normal but there is reduction in dexterity. Before we start doing a nerve conduction test we need to have some idea of what the differential diagnoses might be over here. Well, let's think about the distribution of this. Could it simply be answered by a median neuropathy at the wrist such as carpal tunnel? And the answer would be not really when you think about it because the symptoms extend up the arm. So that wouldn't be the first on our list. Could it be an ulnar nerve problem? Well, again, the distribution is not right. Um, and so if we think about an individual nerve, it's a bit difficult to put it all together. Let's think about something a bit higher up, maybe some brachial plexus issue. Well, to do this, you need to have quite a, a widespread lower trunk plexopathy. Uh, and that really wouldn't be fitting with the clinical picture over here. Nothing really to suggest that on either the clinical examination or in terms of the symptom onset and progression. So let's think a little bit higher. What about radiculopathy? Well, again, there's not really any my clear myotomal or dermatomal issue here that we can pinpoint. Or is it some kind of a musculoskeletal issue? So not very clear with all of this, but let's start with the nerve conduction findings. Let's first have a look at the sensory responses. We can see over here that the amplitude is 6 microvolts and the velocity is 34 meters per second. Hence, the amplitude is both reduced and the velocity is slow. If you haven't already seen the normative data video, please do so now by clicking on the eye card above. And I've also placed some of these numbers here in the box next to these responses. So, we would have expected it to have been 10 microvolts and 50 meters per second. So it's both small and slow, typical of a demyelinated nerve. The ulnar response over here is 12 microvolts and 57 meters per second. That's perfectly fine, perfectly normal. It's above the 5 microvolts and it's also above 50 meters per second. Let's have a look at the contralateral side for the left finger 2 response. Here the amplitude is 16 microvolts and 40 meters per second. The amplitude here is normal, but the conduction velocity is slow. It's less than the 50 meters per second that we would have been expecting. The ulnar sensory response is 11 microvolts in amplitude and 55 meters per second. So it's of a normal amplitude and it's of a normal conduction velocity and it's very symmetrical to the other side. So just to recap, the median sensory responses are both slow more so on the right side than on the left side. And the amplitude has reduced it somewhat on the right side um, compared to the left. Let's have a look now at the motor conduction velocities. The first thing to look at is the distal motor latency. On the right side it's 5.3 milliseconds, on the left side it's 3.7 milliseconds. The right one being prolonged, it's above the 4.5 milliseconds from our normative data parameters. The left side being normal and considering that the stimulation point is before the carpal tunnel and it's being picked up in the motor response of the APB muscle, which is after the carpal tunnel, then this is prol prolongation of conduction across the carpal tunnel. Let's have a look at the conduction velocities. On the right side, it's 48 meters per second. On the left side, it's 54 meters per second. So clearly there's a little bit of drop off of the conduction velocity on the right. This is quite common in carpal tunnel lesions. 
If we look at the motor amplitudes, on the left side it's quite normal, it's 8.9 millivolts. However, on the right side it's already dropped a bit to 5.4 millivolts. If we stimulate more proximally, we see there's no significant drop off in terms of amplitude on either the right or the left side. There's nothing like conduction block, um, which would be indicative of another process. And the F latencies are only somewhat prolonged on the right at 32 milliseconds compared to 27 on the left. So relatively speaking, there is some relative prolongation. The ulnar nerve velocities, the distal motor latency is normal, it's less than three and a half. The conduction velocity in the forearm is over 50 meters per second on both sides, that's very normal. Both sides, it speeds up across the elbow, so there's no cubital tunnel lesions there to consider. And the motor amplitudes are all very normal, and the F latencies are also normal, about 28 milliseconds seconds for both sides as well and when you consider the ulna 28 millisecond f waves then you can also have a look back on the right side the f wave for the median nerve and you can see that there's definitely some prolongation there of the f wave latency so clearly there is some slowing along the line and we've actually managed to localize it on these motor studies at being across the wrist level finally we can have a look at the emg findings as well because we were considering radiculopathy in our differentials here or even potential uh, brachial plexopathy as well and all these were normal. So let's just recap what we have here is sensory reduction in amplitude and slowing across the wrist for both the median sensory digital nerve for F2 on the right side and to a lesser extent on the left side and we also have motor impairment too on the right side for the median nerve, but not on the left side. Putting that all together, so we have isolated median neuropathies across the wrist, and these would be compatible with carpal tunnel lesions. So in conclusion of this study, we have bilateral carpal tunnel lesions, which are moderate on the right and are mild on the left and otherwise normal findings. So I've called the carpal tunnel on the right side moderate and the one on the left side mild. How do we actually know what's mild and moderate or severe? There are a number of grading scales. So the most commonly used ones are the Padua scale produced in 97 and the Canterbury scale produced by Jeremy Bland in 2000. If you have a look at the table here, you can see a variety of parameters which we can use to distinguish between the different levels of severity. The most important thing to note though, is that for moderate carpal tunnel, it needs to have a abnormal distal motor latency. In the case of Padua, this is actually at four milliseconds. And in the case of Bland, it's actually defined as four and a half milliseconds. Making the distinction is, of course, very important in terms of surgical decision-making because most surgery occurs when the carpal tunnel is at moderate severity. If we have a look at this slide from the AANEM, we can see that a variety of different laboratories have produced normative data which show varying distal motor latency upper limits of normality. So if we just go through the table here, we can see a 4.2, a 3.7, a 4.4, a 4, a 4.5, and a 4.3. So there's quite a variability in what's considered to be a prolonged distal motor latency. And if we actually look at the nitty gritty of this table, we can see that there's quite a variety in terms of the cohort ages between different studies, um, and also the stimulation sites as well, exactly where one puts the bar electrode, and also the temperature of the hand as well. Any of these factors can affect the actual value of the distal motor latency. It's really important to have your own normative data for your own particular practice or to know your, your physiology lab's normative data, what they consider to be prolonged for their distal motor latency setting when distinguishing between mild and moderate carpal tunnel. Just to showcase a little bit of my own work, which I presented at a BSCN conference in 2015, for a very young cohort of 62 medical students who all screened for good health, um, I could show very nicely that the upper limits of normal for distal motor latency changes um, between an eight centimeter mark of stimulation to the recording electrodes over the APB muscle or placing it at the wrist crease. And these were produced 
roughly three and a half milliseconds and three milliseconds respectively for the upper limit of normal being defined as mean plus or minus two standard deviations. Coming back to the neurophysiological severity gradings, I think it's sensible to use Jeremy Bland's upper limit of normal of being four and a half milliseconds because this way one can be assured that whatever the variability in, in how studies are performed, that the distal motor latency is prolonged at the four and a half milliseconds with great certainty. The final point I'd like to make in regard to this scenario is the distribution of the symptoms. It's very common for patients to have extra median symptoms. In our own studies uh, and presented at a BSCN conference in 2015, we showed very clearly that 40% of patients have extra median symptoms and it's very common as a clinical scenario for us to see patients with rather diffuse symptoms extending up the arm even to the shoulder and at times into the neck too. Thank you for watching this video and if you've got any questions or comments please do put them in the description box below. Also in terms of the format if it's something that works or something that could be improved on I'd also be grateful for your feedback. Many thanks and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.